But we begin this hour with an alarming new report based on a joint investigation by ProPublica and Nashville Public Radio. A decades-long system and practice of arresting and jailing mostly black children in Rutherford, Tennessee. At the head, the mother of the county, as juvenile court judge Donna Scott Davenport sometimes called herself. That's according to this report. Now the judge calling her work, quote, God's mission, while, while performing so-called God's mission as the head of the county's juvenile justice system, allegedly directing police to arrest children at an alarming rate. It was literally a school to jail pipeline, according to this article. Among cases referred to the juvenile court, the statewide average for how often children are locked up was just 5%, but in Rutherford County, it was 48%. Joining me now, the co-author of this report, this alarming report, Maribel uh, Knight of Nashville Public Radio. Maribel, welcome to BNC Live. Um, first, it's a pleasure to have you. More importantly, thank you for uh, exposing this. Walk us through how this story came about. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, so the incident you're talking about was a, a mass arrest in 2016 uh, of 11 children that were taken in, uh, all for watching a fight. Uh, the charge was criminal responsibility, which turned out to not even be a real charge. And we get more into those details in the story. But a number of children were swept up in this, and it was really the tip of the iceberg. It revealed something really troubling, a pattern in practice in this county that involved uh, this judge and her appointed jailer that were sucking in huge numbers of children to the juvenile court and the juvenile detention center. Well, let's talk about this pattern of practice. Were you surprised by what you uncovered? Yes and no. I had been following the story for a few years. I had heard from lawyers that talked about the high numbers of children that were being uh, detained and sucked into the system. But what really did surprise me was just how much uh, oversight was lacking in this case. So I knew about what was happening in Rutherford County. I knew that this judge had directed law enforcement to when children were arrested for whatever the alleged crime was, even if it was truancy, uh, to take them to the detention center. And I knew that once they got to the detention center, there was this overly aggressive uh, system that was taking a lot of them and saying that they were a threat and that they needed to be kept. But what did surprise me was that my co-reporter Ken Armstrong and I really found that the systems of oversight were woefully inadequate across the board. For instance, the Tennessee Department of Children's Services, they license every juvenile jail in the state. Uh, this policy for how they detained children was written into the facility's handbook. And the state checked every year and licensed this facility every year, and they never once flagged this illegal system. Uh, so that's just one thing that surprised me. Uh, in a host of, of, of many aspects of the reporting was just some things were happening uh, that were inadequate in this one county, and then many other things that were supposed to step in to stop this also weren't happening at a state level. Mara, but speaking of that, why was there such little oversight from the state level, though? Well, that's a really good question. Um, we went through many years of annual inspection reports for this facility. Um, what they're supposed to look at are things like the standard operating procedures, which had this system written down. Uh, when we looked through those inspection reports, they never flagged it. They talked about the cleanliness of the facility, uh, if there was any graffiti, uh, if someone wasn't trained in CPR, for example. I think it's another example of the Department of Children's Services uh, being stretched, not having adequate people to invest the time needed, but also on a county level, um, there are elected you know, county commissioners who oversee uh, the budget for this place and oversee every month uh, you know, the numbers and the reports that come through it. And they never asked any questions about policy. They really just asked about money, about how many beds were being filled. So it seems to me that there was a lot of passing the buck maybe, or a lot of uh, inadequate uh, reporting being done or not asking the right questions or not being thorough. But at any rate, 
what it resulted in was decades long practice of mass incarceration Maribu, um, and aggressive arrest. Do also. you think this would have happened if we were talking about white children and not black and brown children? I know that the system cast a very wide net, but there is a reason why that incident is what starts the article with the arrest of 11 black children. And when it happens, there are two black officers involved in it who are so troubled by it. And they both wonder to themselves, would this be happening at a school with mostly white children? And they don't think it would have. Um, obviously, one of the challenges in this story is that juvenile court records are sealed. So we don't know the race and um, ethnicity of all the children that come through. But in doing many interviews with lawyers who have represented children in the county, just like any other aspect of the criminal justice system, children of color are overwhelmingly represented. But now, in your article, kids as young as seven years old being locked up, the county violating federal law 192 times by keeping kids locked up longer than 24 hours at times, having them locked up up to 10 days. Just talk about the psychological impact that this can have on a child, especially one as young as seven. Yeah, it's really tragic. I mean, we've all heard about the science of children's brains and how it's different and how we have to treat them differently than adults. We talked to a number of children who were caught up in this system at varying levels, and the trauma was there for Many of the children that we talked about in the previous segment, the 11 children that were arrested, when they got their settlements, because they all sued in federal court, a number of them had money earmarked for counseling, and they went through it, and they needed it. They had bad dreams. They didn't want to go to school. They were afraid that they'd be picked up by the police at any time. You know, and we wonder why um, communities of color have such fractured relationships with police. Well, this is an instance where the first encounter they have with them is being taken out of their classroom and put in handcuffs. I mean, just how terrifying, you know? Um, another young man we spoke with who was a plaintiff in the class action lawsuit that was brought against the county, um, Dylan, he was arrested when he was 15. He had never been arrested before. He should not have been kept, but he was kept for four days. He was denied his lithium. He was diagnosed as bipolar and had taken daily medication. He didn't get it. Uh, when he got out, he tried to commit suicide three times in the following year. He had never tried to kill himself before, but when he got out, he was on a completely different track. So the ramifications and the impact are broad. Uh, they can range from things like being scared, having anxiety attacks, bad dreams, to you know um, suicidal ideations and attempts. It, it's, I mean, it really runs the gamut. Yeah, and we know that on top of uh, locking children up at an alarming rate, they were also um, being placed in solitary confinement even after President Obama um, basically had permanently banned the, uh, excuse me, solitary confinement. Uh, the judge actually had to be ordered from a federal level to stop because she continued to practice. Mm -hmm. um, besides healing for this community, uh, Maribah, what's next? I, I read in your report the judge is seeking another term and everyone else who was a part of this is still employed. Yeah, that was a big part of our story. So um, there's been many federal lawsuits that have changed some behaviors by this county. Uh, one of them is the use of solitary confinement for disciplinary purposes. Another is this system that sucked a number of kids in. But the fact of the matter is that the architects of the system are still there. The judge is still the judge. Uh, the jailer is still the jailer. Uh, the judge is up for re-election this coming summer. and the only oversight she really has are the voters. So that's really what's next is, will she be reelected? Um, will there be any more inquiries into the, into the behavior of this county? Um, this was a really interesting story to work on because like I said, some things have been fixed, but the foundation of all of this is still there and the attitudes are still there. And the only thing that's been able to intervene at this point is the federal court system. Yeah, and um, I know that a, a team had recommended creating a statewide case management system in real time um, of mm -hmm. just the data. Has that happened? Mm -hmm. That has not happened. That is a really great question because a big part of what brought this to light 
were annual reports that compiled juvenile detention statistics, and those reports stopped being compiled in 2014. So we literally have no idea what is happening to the kids who are cycling through the juvenile court system in the state of Tennessee. Um, that 48% number was from the last report available. So there are 98 counties in this state. This is just one county that we're writing about. Wow. Um, another question for you. It's just an update on some of the children. You mentioned one of them. I believe he was 15 at the time. Uh, a cousin he was extremely close with committed suicide, just kind of had a wild streak, uh, broke into a few cars. Mm -hmm. He was a gentleman who was denied um, his medication. What about mm -hmm. the other children? How are they doing? You know, it's hard. Um, we talked to Quintarius Frazier, who is a 15-year-old who was held in solitary confinement for long periods of time, and he was the one who brought the federal lawsuit to stop that practice. When I spoke with him and his mother, you could see the impact. Um, she said he has a hard time focusing. He needs stimulation at all times. Even just sitting down to talk for a couple hours with him was hard, you know? He needed to get up, kind of pace around. Um, he was just on edge. You could see that so many months of isolation and not getting what he needed uh, through the system that he had been thrust into, that it had really impacted uh, his day-to-day -day existence, the way his mind worked, um, and the way he interacted with people. Uh, so that's just one instance. Um, a lot of the kids from the incident at the elementary school, um, you know, it depends. One girl had dreams of becoming a police officer. She obviously doesn't want to be that anymore. Um, a lot of them uh, did go through counseling, and so they say they're better off now, but the impact is really, it, it will always be there, and they're relationship with law enforcement is tenuous. Yeah, and there's no telling how many other counties in that state are having, practicing the same type, types of um, practices there. Uh, Maribel, mm -hmm. thank you for joining us. And again, thank you for uncovering this.